Afternoon all. I'd like to do a quick presentation on double-edged swords. Uh, I consider a double-edged sword in chess as a conceptual tool or bias we have for improving our game or playing chess in some manner, which has a logical downside to it, which our opponents might exploit. So, I want to start off with Alekhine's curious quotation I've read recently, which is, I do not play chess, I fight at chess, therefore I willingly combine the tactical with the strategic, the fantastic with the scientific, the combinative with the positional, and I aim to respond to the demands of each given position. This is an Alekhine quotation. And actually, if you look at this quotation in more detail, you'll see he's created kind of complementary pairs here, tactical with strategical, fantastic with scientific, combinative with positional. And if you do combine these methods, you're kind of making sure you're covered. You're not leaving yourself open uh, to exploitation from the opponent. Let's look at some concrete examples. But first, just before we do, a double-edged sword is a sword which you can end up hurting yourself. It's got two edges to it. So in chess we have an opponent. We've got to be careful that anything we do doesn't backfire on us. So that's even including our approach to the game. We might be learning tons of opening theory, but we might be neglecting our middle game and end games. So our opponents, they might get bad positions from the opening, but outplay us later. It was Capablanca that kind of said about improving the end game first, focusing on the end game first, then the middle game, then the openings last. Especially in Capablanca's time, the opening theory was far less developed, so it didn't really matter as long as he didn't get a completely lost position from the opening. He could often outplay his opponents later in the middle game and end game as a result. He was just stronger than most players he faced in those other aspects of the game. So why is there a gap in any tool we use, any conceptual tool or any approach? Well, you're spending your time on a particular perspective. An abstraction is a particular perspective. It's a bias. So if you're choosing to calculate variations in the game, your bias is for calculating deeply. And so you're often calculating forcing moves in particular. And often you're limiting your evaluation to just material mating concerns only. Because you're looking quite a few moves ahead and you're not really... Maybe you're, you're neglecting other parts of evaluation. So your bias could be on depth rather than breadth search. It's a classic trade-off, depth versus breadth. And sometimes you create this perceptual gap as a result. So how do you mind this gap? So let's look at some examples. So positional play and tactics, if we take those as a pair, if we can think positionally and also think tactically, so if you're a positional player, you know, even all the great positional players could actually see all the a lot of the forcing variations, etc. Otherwise they would just be losing tactically all the time. And tacticians would be losing positionally all the time if at the end of their combinations, if they weren't ma less necessarily mating combinations, they ended up with terrible positions which are unplayable. So positional judgment does need to be combined with tactics. You don't want to create this huge gap uh, perceptually. Let's look at another example. Evaluation and calculation. This is one sort of um, implying earlier. Evaluation is like a breadth. You're looking at the, the features of the position. Um, calculation is like you're, you're looking multiple moves ahead. So it's depth versus breadth. But Steinitz, our first world champion, made us look at positions in a completely different way in terms of the elements of positions. Bishop pair, pawn structure, central control, king safety, peace activity. We can't neglect these just because we're calculating variations. Any any positions we end up in, we want to have good control of the elements. 
it can't just be a simple material advantage quite often that's not enough if we give the opponent too much in terms of these other things we'll lose so calculation has this tendency to be in terms of forcing moves and just looking at the simple material gains or mating nets so we've got to be careful that we we're evaluating all these other things I was creating a huge perceptual gap evaluation versus calculation if you look at a lot of the post game commentaries of super GMs and the super GM tournaments they're calculating but they're also evaluating you see the evaluations as well that they're talking about you know very detailed positional evaluations several moves deep so this ability to mix calculation and evaluation I think is critical another example a chess move itself any chess move you make has positive aspects on this channel we talked a lot about the weakness of the last move and looking for the opponent's weakness of the last move they might spend ages thinking up the brilliant move but it might have a weakness to it they're adding something and taking away from something else so any you know even positive or aggressive moves they have a weakness of the last move which can be sometimes exploited and we can link this up with forcing moves etc as well so the opponents carried away with the positives of them of their brilliant move but there's sometimes downsides and you know this is a great way the weakness of the last move of trying to make the opponent's sword double edged against them literally in the in the literal move sense their last move looking at the weakness of the last move so sometimes how do you avoid this sometimes you do a lot of do nothing moves quiet waiting moves you try and do nothing too significant uh, to not carry too many weaknesses of the last move sometimes it's better to do nothing than to do something positional play and combinations so if you're playing position you're slowly improving your position you're trying to put yourself beyond the feet an art of war principle but if you're playing com if you play a combination it might carry risk you might have miscalculated you might blow your whole position unnecessarily but um, also you know um, sometimes a combination is a good way to finish off the opponent maybe if you if you leave them on the board they come back at you they come back at you they improve their position so they're both double-edged swords um, of course it's the opponent which cast doubt on any 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 single approach being good it's the opponent creating this double edge to anything we use positional play or combinatory play inspiration and effort if we go through and, and avoid looking at master games I think especially brilliant master games they can carry sometimes inspirational ideas we can use on our own games if we just make an effort just for our own games without studying um, games which are necessarily brilliant um, we'll get a certain ideas from our own games but I think this is good to try and have inspiration as well as effort and also on the board you know to think um, using imagination inspiration not just calculation so you're looking way ahead you're fantasizing positions if you're playing a calculator of variations that doesn't look creatively then maybe they've missed something extremely creative which their normal calculations wouldn't come up with so a recent blitz game this Nakamura night sack on c3 it was just from a Nakamura game a brilliant Nakamura game sometimes you can draw inspiration on master games or maybe to a certain extent by yourself in your own games but it's good to seek inspiration I think from master games this focus on opening theory and or middle game tactics and, and end games or middle game positional play wherever we focus our training efforts we're leaving ourselves relatively weak some of my friends at the chess club are much more theoretically booked up but you know I, I love myself looking at middle game theories I myself might be relatively weaker in the end games because I don't really study end game books that much so we leave ourselves relatively weak from our own interests in the game our perspective on the game we leave ourselves weak to opponents in other areas Now the idea of exploiting weaknesses, when you have exploitable weaknesses, you're you're looking to exploit weaknesses. Sometimes you can just maintain the tension. Again, this, this relates to do nothing moves or do something moves. If you maintain the tension, the opponent could throw at you more weaknesses. They you could give your opponent 
more rope to hang themselves with, as they say, there's that expression. So this could have a downside. You try and exploit the opponent's weaknesses, but you're giving the opponent routes into your own position. You're giving your opponent open files as you're trying to exploit the opponent's weaknesses. They're going to hijack those files. Petrosian was good at that. If people went at Petrosian to attack him, sometimes it would all backfire. He'd do a, a positional sacrifice and hijack all the lines. There's a classic uh, Spassky game against Petrosian. Spassky tried to open up all these lines against Petrosian and end up with this beautiful Queen H8 check at the end, losing to that. Maintaining the tension is, is often a, a, a more effective idea to win games. And I remember this this talk in Gibraltar, this Magnus Carlsen talk, where often it was showing game examples in this presentation where Magnus would just sit on a position and, and wait for more weaknesses rather than go all in, and the opponents would self-destruct. But you know, sometimes you do need to put the opponent in the way. You know, you do need to kick the boot in sometimes, otherwise the opponent comes back at you and comes back at you, and maybe improves their position. Chess is very hard, but to, to be aware of these complementary ideas is very useful to kind of mine this perceptual gap. Winning and losing itself, when you win you become arrogant, when you lose you become, you, you have humility. So they're both kind of double-edged swords which for most of us sort themselves out. We don't become too arrogant because we have painful losses usually. And you know, losing often drives us to improve more. Capablanca has said this, that we learn most from our losses. It's it's just again, you know, double edged swords. If you're winning all the time but your opponents weren't that good, when you up against stronger opposition, you'll find out that you actually had weaknesses in your game, it was worth going over your games, whether winning or losing. So if you Create imbalances. This is a Silman like trendy thing. You know, sometimes you can just play solidly. Sometimes you can just keep the pawn structure absolutely symmetrical and, and try and win the end games. This is a perfectly valid style of play. As well, you don't have to play exciting chess. In, in playing exciting chess or exciting openings, like the King's Engine Defense, we risk getting our queen side destroyed. We say to ourselves after, why didn't I just play the Slav Defense? more rock solid system. The Slav, of course, I'm joking here, has a lot of very dynamic, aggressive lines. Each opening can carry a you know, mixture of very dry, solid, or very dynamic, exciting lines. If you play the French defense, you could be playing a gambit of the G7 pawn, a lot of dynamic complications, for example. If you play the Sicilian defense, you could end up with a stodgy position because the opponent plays Bishop b5. So anyway, but this general approach, you know, they carry weaknesses. If you create imbalances, the nature of imbalances, you're getting something and you're giving the opponent something. It's a perfect double-edged sword metaphor to create imbalances. You can win with your side if you've got favourable imbalances. The opponent can win if they prove that their imbalances are more favourable than what they've given you. A classic, you know, you open up the e file in the king's engine against the e pawn, but you expose your d6 pawn. Who will win? It depends. If they can block up the e, you know, make the e pawn irrelevant, then your d6 loses the game, as proven time and time again. Double edged sword again. You create and strive imbalances in the position. You're creating double edged swords. Or you can play as solidly as possible. There's a risk there as well drawing a lot of games but also the opponent might play uh, dynamically at some point okay so materialism and dynamism these two are interesting you know often when you play try and go for material it's at the expense of dynamic pressure from the opponent we play dynamically you could end up losing end games especially in long games in blitz chess I think it's more important to play dynamically as I mentioned here end games don't matter so much the opponent has so many practical problems, they often slip up. It's in inaccurate moves by, by the nature of blitz. So sometimes in blitz, it's more important, I think, the dynamic side of the equation here. Perfectionism and pragmatism. The longer the time limit, the more, I think, perfectionism 
is, is useful. The shorter, you know, pragmatism, again, it, it's linked with dynamic and, and materialism. If you try and find perfect moves, it can be exhausting as well. And it's often better to play practical moves. And often perfect moves, you know, it's computers that can play perfect moves because the difficulty of playing the resulting positions, they don't mind. But for us, we need positions which are, are playable after. We might find a perfect move, but it's a difficult to play position. So the perfect move may be a, a brilliant combinatory idea, but it might have technical flaws as well. Or it might actually work, but the resulting positions are just too difficult to play. So it might have been better to have been more practical and maintained the tension. So this this whole video, um, well, a few influences, some of my recent over the board games, and also this question on Reddit. Um, so I'll give you this link in the video. What is the difference between positional play and tactical play? I consider them both double-edged swords. They really need each other, and this is what I've said here. And I quoted the Alekhine quote as well as a Max Erver quote. And um, this document, this Google document presentation, will be in the link in the description link of this video because some of it has been obscured in this presentation. So you can read the whole thing, and I hope it it just provides some thought because when I did another presentation video recently, you know, it went down well, and I think it's nice to have a good balance on the channel between concrete videos all the time about specific games and thinking more fundamentally about chess. So I hope you enjoyed this one and, and it's provoked some thinking. Comments or questions on YouTube? Oh sorry, pardon me, just before we go, conclusions. Chess <laughs> requires a holistic approach. This is looking at different angles and bringing them together. So that's how you learn the game, how you play the game. So you avoid creating these huge perceptual gaps as, as much as possible. We don't want to create the double-edged swords. So I've given an example. You may be an opening bookworm. You get great positions for the opening but lose later. Or you might be brilliant ca on calculation, but you keep mis-evaluating the end positions. So mind the perceptual gaps is the key thing, I think, the key conclusion. So my premature comments or questions on YouTube, I'm repeating again. I hope this provides a lot of food for thought. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.